um, Professor Kerry Andrew Emmanuel and dear participants. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's nice webinar on politics of climate change. We are really honored to have Professor Kerry Emmanuel with us to talk on this very important and interesting topic. I, on behalf of NICE and the participants, would like to welcome Professor Emmanuel. Professor Emmanuel, let me briefly introduce you to our institute. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. Climate change, change is one of our major research topics. Uh, Professor Emmanuel, uh, as you know that Nepal is a mountainous country which lies between India and China, the world's largest carbon emitting countries of the region. So climate change is of grave concern to us. The glaciers have started to burst. In May 2012, 10 people were killed and 60 got missing due to the bursting of glaciers. In December 2009, on the eve of 2009 United Nations Climate Change Conference, Copenhagen, Nepal hosted a cabinet meeting on climate change at the Mount Everest base camp, the highest altitude in the world. In terms of climate change vulnerability, Nepal is ranked 13th in the world. Nepal has signed the United Nations Framework on Convention of Climate Change and ratified the Paris Agreement adopted during the 21st session of the United Nations Framework on Convention of Climate Change, and that uh, was held in 2015. In order to mitigate the impact of climate change, Nepal has adopted uh, Nepal's National Adaptation Plan of Action 2009-2010 and Local Adaptation Plan for Action 2011 under the framework of United Nations Framework on Convention of Climate Change. Both these organizations are functioning on empowering global government to ensure effective climate change adaptation. However, these policies at some level seem to focus on meeting the goals and objectives of the donor agencies rather than striving to make real impact on the lives of the affected group of people. Since the issue is of great, great concern for Nepal and the world, we are doing a series of climate change uh, dialogue. Uh, before we start, let me briefly introduce Professor Kerry Emanuel, though he need no introduction. Professor Kerry Andrew Emanuel is an American professor of meteorology, currently working at the MIT in Cambridge. His research interests focus on tropical meteorology and climate with a specialty at atmospheric convention and the mechanisms acting to intensify hurricanes. Professor Emmanuel received an SB degree in Earth and Planetary Science and PhD in Meteorology, both from MIT. After completing his doctorate, he joined the Faculty of the Atmospheric Science Department of the University of California at Los Angeles, where he remained for three years with a brief hiatus filming Toronto's in Oklahoma and Texas. In 1981, when I was born, he joined the Faculty of the Department of Meteorology at MIT and was promoted to full professor in 1987 in what had since become the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Science. In 1989, he assumed dictators, uh, directorship of EAPS, Center for Meteorology and Physical Oceanography, a post he held until 1997. Subsequently, he chaired the EAPS program in atmosphere, Atmospheres, Ocean and Climate from 2009 to 2012. He's a founder member of MIT Lorentz Center, a climate think tank which, for, which fosters uh, creative approaches to learning how climate works. He was named one of the time 100 influential people of 2006. In 2007, he was elected as a member of the US National Academy of Science and member of American Philosophical Society in 2019 and foreign member of the Royal Society in 2020. Professor Emmanuel is the author or co-author of over 200 peer reviewed scientific papers and three books, including Divine Wind, The History of Science and Hurricanes, published by Oxford University Press, and what we know about climate change published by MIT Press. Once again, we'd like to welcome Professor Emmanuel to our program. Professor Emmanuel, you have around 30 to 35 minutes to make your remarks, uh, which will be followed by question and answers. The, prog the program is streamed live on seven Facebook pages. Therefore, we request all our participants to drop their questions under Facebook Live or share it on Zoom chat. You can also send your questions by Twitter or WhatsApp that is being displayed on our screen. Professor Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jayswal. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you here this morning. Um, as uh, Dr. mentioned, I'm a, a climate scientist. 
but I have also become very interested in solutions to the climate problem, and I'll be talking about both of those today. So without further ado, I hope you can see my screen. Um, the program is, uh, first of all, the talk, just to review for a few minutes, the evidence for human effects on climate, which are now quite powerful, uh, to talk about climate risks, and finally, to wind up by talking about technical and policy options. And when I speak about climate risk, I will focus a little bit at least on climate risk to uh, Nepal. Uh, so this particular chart uh, shows the composition of the atmosphere. Many of you know this from, from uh, grade school uh, chemistry or earth science courses. Most of the atmosphere is made of nitrogen and oxygen, 78% nitrogen, about 21% oxygen, a little bit of argon, um, but none of those gases really make very much difference to the climate uh, in terms of uh, how radiation passes through them. What really matters are the greenhouse gases, which are in that little thin orange sliver, which you may not be able to see, um, but together they comprise about a quarter of 1% of the atmosphere, and most of that is water vapor. Now, back in the 19th century already, it was shown that those gases make the difference between a climate which is uninhabitable, where the mean surface temperature is down around minus 18 degrees centigrade, or about zero degrees Fahrenheit, and the actual uh, temperature of the planet, which is uh, closer to being uh, around uh, 15 degrees centigrade or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So this has been understood uh, since the end of the 19th century quite well. There's nothing particularly new about that. Uh, what's surprising is, uh, and this was again discovered in the 19th century, that most of that greenhouse gas is just water vapor. Um, it's about 0.25% of the mass of the atmosphere, but as you know, it's highly variable. It's the most important greenhouse gas because there's so much of it but it's controlled mostly by temperature itself. And it has a response time of about two weeks. So water vapor is not in any sense controlling the climate, it's a feedback. That is, if one warms the atmosphere, uh, there will be more water vapor in it. It's a greenhouse gas that will further warm it. And that's called a positive feedback. And it's very important, positive feedback in the climate system. So for, on longer time scales, more than a few weeks, climate is very strongly influenced by what we call the long-lived greenhouse gases, the most important of which is CO2 or carbon dioxide, and also methane and nitrous oxide and a handful of others that together comprise only about four one hundredths of 1% of the mass of the atmosphere. So um, it is a bit like having a, a, a large auditorium temperature controlled by that. And the critical operating component of the thermostat's a tiny bead of mercury uh, inside of it. It's a tiny bit of mass, but it has a huge controlling influence. And the worrying thing is that we uh, human beings have demonstrably increased the concentration of carbon dioxide by about 46% since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, we're continuing to do that. We cannot keep doing that without incurring very large risks to ourselves and to our descendants. So what is the evidence for our influence on greenhouse gases? It's quite powerful and I don't have time to review all of it, except to say that the idea that we're altering it goes back a long way too, to the Swedish chemist, Svante Arrhenius, um, who at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century published his findings, and of course he had no access to, there are no computers or anything like this. This is just pure basic physics he was working with and estimated he was the first to worry that changing carbon dioxide would influence climate. And he estimated that if one were to double carbon dioxide, one would increase the surface temperature by about four degrees centigrade, which is well within the range of modern estimates. So it tells you uh, what you can do with a paper and pencil. How did Arrhenius' prediction fare? Well, quite well, actually. So this is a curve going from 1880, about the time he was working, to more or less the present. 
showing a measure of carbon dioxide concentration in blue. Uh, that's been measured carefully since 1958, but we can deduce what it was from looking at bubbles of gas trapped in ice cores going back a long way, actually. The red curve is the global mean annual mean surface temperature. And of course, there's a lot of things influencing it, volcanoes, uh, random variability, El Nino, but you can see that basically it follows the curve just as Arrhenius predicted. So climate science is very confident that we are altering the climate, we're altering the temperature, and the question is why should that matter to us? Now, if we go back further in time, using ice cores, here is the carbon dioxide content going back a thousand years. This is before uh, industry began. It had a concentration of about 280 parts per million. But with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, it really started to soar up. And now it is quite literally off the charts. Okay, It's uh, 410 and climbing very rapidly. This is what we have done to our atmosphere. Now, if we focus in on Nepal, um, we have good measurements going back some time, but I'm showing you a chart going back uh, only for a period of 15 years between 2000 uh, and 2015. You can see the source for this uh, graph is quite recent. And what you're seeing are trends in precipitation, the blue line here, and you can read it off of this scale. This is annual precipitation and trends in temperature, the red curve. Temperature is going up and with a little bit less statistical significance, precipitation is uh, going down here and going down in Nepal. So Nepal is by no means immune from these uh, trends. And the question is, what are the specific risks? And in his introduction, Dr. Jaiswal mentioned uh, one of them, which is the problem of melting glaciers. Uh, causing uh, terrific floods. And this is a very serious issue there. Now, when we go to the future, unfortunately, as with many predictions, uh, there's a large uncertainty. And part of the uncertainty is that we don't know how much more carbon dioxide we're going to admit going forward. So this chart on the left shows projections of carbon dioxide concentration. Actually, sorry, I take that back. This is projections of carbon dioxide emissions, not concentrations, uh, all the way up to the end of this century. And all these different projections depend upon different predictions about what we're going to do. And of course, it's impossible to predict what we as a species will do. But if we don't do anything at all, we're just going to keep admitting more and more carbon dioxide if we take on the other extreme, extreme, uh, extreme measures to curtail emissions, well, we might actually get a reduction in emissions. Now, if we put that all together with our understanding of the physics of climate and uh, the carbon cycle, we get a corresponding scatter in projected global mean annual mean temperature. Um, and so this again is going toward the end of the century. This curve on the right, it could be anywhere from, <clears throat> from about three degrees to five degrees according to these projections. And this is a very serious matter, a very serious projected increase in temperature. Now, um, in addition to uncertainty about emissions, uh, we climate scientists are not uh, arrogant and we um, understand that there's uncertainty in climate modeling. Climate is an enormously complex system. And there are not that many people, actually, not, not that many scientists working on these hard problems. And so what we see is for a doubling of carbon dioxide, a range of probabilities of temperature change. And this chart shows global mean annual mean temperature change from doubling carbon dioxide going from one to seven degrees. And then this red curve shows the estimated probability of, of the doubling of CO2. So we're not now focusing on the problem of how much CO2 we're going to emit, but given a doubling of CO2, how much warming we will get, you can see that the most probable estimates between two and three degrees, but there is a dangerous tail out here where it could be more than four and a half degrees and a safe tail down at the low end where it could be less than about two and about one and three quarter degree. 
if we're out in this tail, uh, it's a it's a threat to all of civilization. If we're in the middle of somewhere, it's a question of the cost of mitigating this versus the cost of adapting to it. Now, the problem with that is that if we stick to the higher projections of CO2 emissions, um, we're going to go well beyond doubling carbon dioxide. In fact, uh, this is carbon dioxide concentration. Uh, this is historically what it's been since about 1950, this black dashed line. This horizontal blue line is uh, doubling its pre-industrial value. And then these are the various projections depending on what we do. And you can see that most of them uh, by the end of the century well exceed. And if we do nothing at all to curb emissions, uh, we'll be close to tripling carbon dioxide. So we're going to go into very dangerous territory if we do that. Now, the problem uh, here is also a problem of the carbon cycle. And I don't have time to really talk about it. It's fascinating, not entirely solved problem. But uh, carbon dioxide, as I mentioned, has a complex uh, lifetime in the atmosphere. What you see on this upper chart is a history of carbon dioxide concentration, and then a projection going forward. And then we assume that at some point, we just turn off the spigot altogether and calculate what happens to carbon dioxide. So for example, this curve, we assume that when it gets to 650 parts per million, today it's at 410, we just completely stop emissions. Of course, it's very hypothetical exercise. You can see there's a rapid decline for about 100 years, but then it kind of levels off and it takes thousands and thousands of years to go back to pre-industrial levels, thousands of years. And um, this has to do with the physics of carbon uh, being uh, sequestered in the deep ocean and so forth, but it's a very long time scale. So unless we learn how to artificially extract carbon from the atmosphere, we're going to be stuck with uh, very high levels of carbon dioxide for many, many, many human generations. The bottom curve is the global mean, annual mean temperature that goes along with this, okay? And you can see that to a good approximation, whatever temperature we have when we finally stop emitting CO2 is the temperature we're going to have for a very long time, again, unless we figure out how to extract carbon from the atmosphere. What are the risks? Uh, that, that, again, is a large topic, increasing sea level. It's not really a concern in Nepal, but for many countries it is. Increasing hydrological events, droughts and floods is going to be a big deal just about everywhere, including in Nepal. Um, increased incidence of high category hurricanes, because this is something I work on. I'll say a little bit more about that. And uh, especially associated storm surges and freshwater flooding from heavy rain. More heat stress and other health risks. And then the thing that keeps some of us awake at night is that especially these hydrological extremes um, historically and at present are causing mass migrations away from areas that no longer can support populations uh, with food and water. And that invariably leads to armed conflict in history. And armed conflict in a nuclear armed world is not a pretty thing to think about. Now, there are a few benefits of of climate change. There's at least some initial increase in plant productivity from the direct effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and a reduction in health problems that are related to cold weather. But if you sum over all these things, because the species, our species, is so beautifully adapted to the climate we've had over the last 7,000 years, any change is disruptive. And so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that it taken on a whole, as a whole, um, the evidence says that there'll be rather large net damages because of climate change. Now, hydrological extremes, you don't need fancy models to show this, just the grounding in physics. Uh, rainfall intensity um, goes up very quickly with temperature doubling for about every 10 degrees C increase, just as basic physics. And yet we can't, for other interesting reasons, change global annual mean rainfall very much. 
what that means is that when it rains and where it rains, it will rain harder, but there'll be longer intervals between rain. And that means we should see uh, more uh, droughts and floods. And as I mentioned before, there's a large potential effect on food and water supplies. It's a major national security issue. So more floods and more droughts. Places that are already wet will get wetter. Places that are already dry will get drier. And uh, the United States uh, Defense Department considers this to be a major national security threat. And this is probably true of most countries uh, because of the uh, potential for climate change to weaken fragile governments and contribute to food and water scarcity which increases disease and may spur uh, or exacerbate mass migration. Now, what about Nepal? So I'm relying here on a, a study that was done very locally but with you. Um, and it's not, it's not any uh, more, um, any less concerning than for many other parts of the world. The models project that the temperature in Nepal will increase between half and two degrees C by the 2030s already and three to six degrees uh, by the 2090s um, with extremely hot days projected to increase by 55% by the 2060s and 70% by the 2090s. Extremely hot nights, which are of concern because they affect people's quality of sleep, for example, are projected to go up very steeply this century. And um, they're not, not as confident about changes in precipitation uh, because of our failure to really understand how climate, so far, to understand how climate change will affect monsoons. Anywhere, a decrease of anywhere from 14% to 40%, and then uh, maybe an increase later in the century, but I would say that collectively we have less confidence in precipitation. There's also the possibility of other problems, for example, stemming from melting glaciers and more uh, storms originating in the Bay of Bengal, which I'll talk about in a minute. In fact, right now, I look at fatalities from tropical cyclones in your neighbor to the south, Bangladesh, going back to the 18th century. And this is on a log scale here. Um, we can see that there are increasing numbers of events. Um, this increase in the number of people killed is partially because the population itself is increasing. And this great reduction in deaths in recent decades in particular is because of efforts to build evacuation shelters where people can save their own lives. That's been very, very successful. But the storminess does seem to be increasing. Um, uh, here is uh, how we do it at MIT. We generate uh, synthetic tropical cyclone tracks driven by climate as simulated by models or as uh, analyzed in climate reanalyses. What you're seeing are the tracks beginning of the dots of the 50 most intense of 3,800 synthetic tropical cyclones that are, tr that are crossing the coast of Bangladesh. And this is for a separate study that we've done. And you can see that there are occasional storms that make it up to Nepal. They're not strong as windstorms, but they can produce devastating rain uh, uh, and um, associated flooding conditions. So we're concerned about that. And when we look at forward projections of these uh, rainfall, this is now in, in Bangladesh further south, but qualitatively we would expect it to apply to Nepal. This is a return period in years. So the, the smaller the return period, the more frequent the event. And this is storm total rainfall in millimeters. The blue is, uh, is climate models, uh, seven CMIP6 climate models run at the end of the 20th century. And the shading is the scatter, the blue is the mean. The red is the same models run for the end of this century. And again, the shading is the scatter among the models and this is the mean. And you can see the spectacular increases in tropical cyclone related rainfall. And this is a big concern to me 
and should be a concern to you because of the terrible flooding potential by these storms. And that includes Nepal, uh, where historically there have been floods caused by the remnants of tropical cyclones. Now, finally, I wanna turn the page more in the policy direction. What are we gonna do about these risks? And I'm gonna say something I like to say because I like to be optimistic, and that is where there's risk, there's opportunity. It may sound a little uh, Machiavellian to you, but it is true. Uh, if the world is gonna do something about this, the people who figure out how to do it first, uh, it are going to um, do quite well. So the global annual energy market today is about $7 trillion. It's a very, very large number. It's about a third of our GDP in the US. It is decarbonizing, not nearly fast enough, but it is. And so uh, people are shifting to low carbon energy sources. It, now it's universally recognized that your neighbor to the north, China is capturing this market. Not the US, uh, not Russia, but China. US uh, is still um, arguably has an edge in technical innovation, but while there are global net transition costs, the countries, and maybe Nepal could be one of these, that lead in low carbon energy technology are going to come out ahead economically. So what is the nature of the problem? So this chart at the left, this pie chart, shows uh, all uh, greenhouse gas emissions divided into their source. 72% originate from energy, but there are other things that cause CO2 emissions, agriculture, waste, land use changes, and some industrial processes. But if we focus on energy that's gray, we break that down, a lot of it goes into generating electricity, some of it goes into manufacturing, a great deal goes into transportation, and there are a few other things. So this sort of tells us the nature of the problem we're trying to solve here. Now, because of the fact that economies are growing around the world, and we hope they will continue to, particularly to alleviate poverty in many places, uh, carbon emissions are projected to go up. Energy use per capita is projected to go up in any case. So things will only get worse unless we can transition away from carbon or learn how to take carbon out of the atmosphere economically. So in a nutshell, we have to rapidly decarbonize the global economy if we're going to avoid these risks. But the economic development of nations depends great, crucially on greatly increasing per capita energy consumption. I'm in favor of doing this, you might be surprised to learn, because poverty is also a terrible problem. It's not just climate as it affects developed countries. If we're going to uh, uh, help nations alleviate their poverty, we have to see even more rapid growth in electricity production so that we can produce more energy and decarbonize at the same time. So to decarbonize transportation, we have to switch to battery powered or synthetic fuel powered cars, for example, and trucks. We still need non-electrical energy for high temperature industrial applications. This is not trivial. It's not all about electrifying. We can help with conservation, but it won't be nearly enough. Uh, it's, it's nice if you can do it, but it's not going to uh, make much of a dent in this problem that's discussed above. Well, so now here's where the numbers get a little bit uh, sobering. What is it going to take to decarbonize the global economy by 2040? So the projected global electrical power consumption, which includes the idea that we will electrify vehicles in 2040, it's only 20 years from now, 5 trillion watts, double what it is today. That's just electrical power. If we look at global energy consumption uh, by 2040, we're projected to consume 25 trillion watts. That's a lot of energy. So how are we gonna do it? Well, okay, so what are the opportunities? There's a lot of focus on renewables, solar and wind, rapidly falling photovoltaic prices for solar and wind turbine costs, but 
uh, at low market concentration, if we have less than 30% of the grid is renewables, you can deal with intermittency because you've got other sources, neighbors supplying other sources through coal, natural gas, mostly fossil fuel. The problem is, is that because the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine, over the grid, you have to maintain a full capacity to cover everything, including the 30% that on average is covered by renewables. So at higher market penetration, you have to rely on storage of energy. But the problem is that the best current method, according to the engineers, is of storing energy for relatively short period of time is lithium ion batteries. For 12 hours, it costs about $4,000 per kilowatt hour. And we're gonna need 5 trillion watts capacity globally by 2040. And that means it'll cost a trillion dollars a year for 20 years to build the storage. But these batteries only last 10 years. So you're talking about by the time you're all said and done, $2 trillion a year just to maintain the storage. And that's only 12 hours. What are you gonna do when you have a blocking uh, high pressure system and you're out of uh, wind for weeks at a time? So engineers think this is simply not possible to contemplate going to 100% renewables. 30%, okay, very good. 100%, it's not gonna work. Now, you can still continue to burn natural gas if you can take the carbon out, but it's very expensive. Currently $200 a ton of carbon. It's projected to go to 100 at best. Uh, so if we use that $100 per ton number and we use projected emissions by 2040 or 40 billion tons per year, that's if we go, if we're doing all gas, that's $4 trillion a year. It's very expensive. And then you need to add in the cost of the gas itself, $2 trillion a year. So we're talking about $6 trillion a year just for electricity. And that's not feasible unless we can have a breakthrough in carbon sequestration. Then there's nuclear fission. So if we use the projected electricity demand by 2500, um, it's equivalent to or by 2040, it's equivalent to 2,500 two gigawatt nuclear reactors globally. We'd have to build 125 two gigawatt reactors per year. That's a lot. The current cost to build one in South Korea, who are very good at it, is $4 billion. So that's $500 billion a year, or about 6.6% of current world domestic product. The nice thing about these is that they have a long service life. And that rate of construction was accomplished by countries like Sweden and France in the 1970s and 80s who built one four gigawatt reactor for 10 million residents per year. If you scale that up, you get far more than this 125. So that's, we know that's possible because we've done it before. And uh, this is just a chart showing the rate of ramping up of nuclear energy. Um, there's a lot of propaganda about nuclear energy, which is too bad. A lot of people have false beliefs about it. It's not only not dangerous. This is just a chart showing mortality per trillion kilowatt hours by source, coal, oil, gas, hydro, solar, nuclear is the uh, safest power we've ever generated by far. Uh, there's only been one accident and that was Chernobyl that killed people through radiation. And uh, by displacing coal, uh, which causes big health problems, it's actually saved uh, probably about 2 million uh, lives around the world. Uh, there are a lot, I'm not gonna labor over this, but we don't have to rely on 1950s nuclear technology. There are a lot better ways of doing things that are being developed actively, particularly in China right now. Uh, and just very quickly, but whatever you do to decarbonize, whether it's renewables, nuclear, whatever, you save money uh, and lives because of the big health problems of burning fossil fuels. World Health Organization says 4 million premature deaths a year globally and annually from particulate pollution. If we use what economists uh, use as the economic value of life, $100,000, just by decarbonizing, we would save $400 billion per year. 
It doesn't matter how you decarbonize, it's just the, the, the savings of getting rid of these health costs. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to cheap green energy and including the elimination or reduction of poverty in the developing world. So when you add it all up, energy conversion would likely yield big net benefits, even before you talk about the benefit of eliminating climate change. Um, the climate costs, the costs of climate change have been estimated to be around $3 trillion a year. So how are we gonna do this? I'm just gonna wrap this up. I don't have any profound thoughts here. All the economists say that the one thing you have to do at the very minimum is to price what's called the negative externalities like these health problems of carbon emissions and charge the emitters what it costs the health industry to deal with them. It's a bedrock free market principle. Almost all economists in this country support this idea. Uh, you'd get rid of coal overnight if you did this. Tomorrow it would be gone. It's already essentially disappearing. And markets rather than ideologies would determine the best for it mix of solutions. But an economist will admit this, it isn't enough. It's necessary, but we really have to stimulate technical innovation. Governments, most for the most part, have to do this. So let me summarize very quickly. We're altering the composition of our atmosphere at considerable risk to ourselves and to future generations. But where there's risk, there's also opportunity, cheap Green power offers pathways to increase the quality of life globally. We should be excited about this. We shouldn't be dreading it. We need to adopt a combination of different energy sources to most rapidly and inexpensively decarbonize. You must get yourself out of the mindset, which unfortunately our tribal societies have today is gonna to be all this or all that. No scenario that experts look at work with 100% anything. You have to have a diverse mix of energy generation, diverse mix. So current storage costs limit intermittent renewables to less than 40% market penetration. Uh, we know from experience we can ramp up fission very quickly. But right now uh, in global markets, it can actually younger people stand up and say, we must do it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very comprehensive presentation. It was really enlightening. We immensely benefited from it. I'm sure our participants also benefited from the presentation because we have received lots of questions. So let's move to the question and answers. And the first question here is that, do you think that the world is going to deal with climate change seriously in the post COVID-19 world? Has pandemic taught any lesson to most powerful and developed countries as they are the most affected by it? That's a very nice question. Thank you for asking it. And I'm an optimist and I think we have learned that to manage global crises and the pandemic is clearly one, we need global governance. We need global leadership. It's not gonna be done done by markets. Governments play a huge role, uh, for example, in the pandemic, in, in going back many decades, stimulating the basic research that led to the ability to develop a vaccine, uh, but also in managing the crises that did well. Countries like the states that manage them poorly are doing poorly. So I think we are learning lessons, and I'm optimistic that maybe these lessons can be carried over to the problem of climate change. Let's move to the next question. Uh, how will Biden administration address the policy, environmental policy, keeping into consideration the backward steps taken by the Trump administration? Fortunately, even in his first few days in office, President, very bad things that were done his predecessor, uh, Trump, change. And I'm very optimistic because they are uh, taking, again, the approach that I favor, which is to look at a diversity of new energy sources and how they can be developed economically. Uh, we have third question. Uh, is it too late to prevent climate change? What is the way forward to tackle climate change at individual level? Okay, um, we already have changed the climate. There's no question. 
So uh, there's too late to stop all climate change. Sea level has gone up, storms have increased, temperature has gone up. Uh, we can't, we can't uh, go back to uh, 1850. Um, but we can uh, still avoid the worst risks that will occur if we just keep accelerating our emissions. Now, as to individual choice, I get asked this question all the time. The way we are going to tackle this problem successfully is through massive collective action at the national and global scales. And so I think the most important thing you can do as an individual by far is to organize politically, okay? That, may, that means putting pressure on governments. It may mean demonstrations. You're not going to solve the problem by changing your light bulbs, okay? You're just not. You have to be a global citizen. You have to act as a global citizen. You do have to act collectively if we're gonna tackle this problem. Uh, Professor, there is one interesting question. Is there any connection between animal agriculture and climate change? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed between what did you say? Is there any connection between animal agriculture, animal husbandry and climate change? Oh, animal husbandry and climate. Yes, indeed there is, because I, if you remember one of the charts I showed you was that there's an appreciable amount of carbon put into the atmosphere through farming, uh, uh, husbandry and agriculture. And um, the consumption of beef, for example, ends up producing much more carbon dioxide than the consumption of vegetables. So yes, um, certainly that, uh, that will uh, help to be able to transition away from a very meat intensive um, husbandry uh, practices. Uh, like you all know that uh, US-China is having a conflicting relation at the moment. So how is US-China rivalry going to impact uh, the issue of climate change in the future? Um, how is US, what, did, what was the word after US? US-China rivalry, US-China conflict. I'm still not, I, I'm still not getting that word. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry. It's a, the connection isn't what it should be, but. Uh, yes, yeah. how is US-China conflict going to impact climate change, US-China rivalry, the competition. Oh, US-China, oh, right. Well, that's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. I think it's actually gonna be good for climate change because I'm up and I'll tell you why. Because I think the US, if it ever wakes up and it's still asleep, will recognize that China is capturing the, the movement to decarbonize industry and, and the, the economy in general. And if the United States decides finally to compete with China on carbon free energy, it will accelerate the decarbonization everywhere. Uh, there's one another question that how the developed countries are contributing in negating the climate change. Well, I think that, you know, it, it's a tragedy that a lot of the uh, first countries to be severely affected by climate change are developing countries, particularly coastal countries, island nations. And I think that the best thing they can do is, uh, depends on their size and scale, the best thing they can do is to put political pressure and make a lot of noise uh, about their condition and their situation, put a lot of pressure on world governments to, uh, to take this problem seriously. I also think that medium-sized developing countries uh, can leapfrog the highly developed countries technologically by stimulating technically up with their own sources of, of carbon free energy and trying to compete that way economically. I, I have, I'm optimistic that medium sized countries could do this. Uh, Professor, there is one question from the Indian scholar. He's asking, what are your recommendations for South Asia in general and India in particular to control climate change? Well, it's, it's a very, very important problem because the projected emissions from these regions are very large. And if, the, if these countries um, increase, as we sort of hope they will, per capita energy consumption as a way both of alleviating poverty and reducing population growth because wealth is a key to reducing population growth. If they do this with fossil fuels, the game is over. We're not gonna get anywhere. Uh, so 
on the other hand, expect them, and we shouldn't ask them to do it uh, based upon very expensive technologies or unreliable technologies. So I think that there's a strong incentive for countries in Southeast Asia and for India to come up with uh, carbon-free uh, technology, whether it's uh, carbon-free energy sources or ways of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere that are more economical. Uh, and I sort of hope that will happen. For example, I think India is, is, could undertake what I would call a nuclear renaissance, where uh, they massively build fission plants. They are building fission plants, just not fast enough. And we in the, in, in the United States, China, Russia, and other countries could help a lot by developing advanced nuclear technology and solar and wind technology to make it better and cheaper for countries uh, in Southeast Asia and India to increase energy without increasing carbon, with, while at the same time reducing carbon emissions. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question like, what are the major factors that causes global warming? If you have to advise two to three sectors, what would you be to control climate change? And there's another question, uh, what are the major solutions to the new climate change? So, I mean, the, there's no question that the major uh, source of man-made climate change is emissions of greenhouse gases. And that's carbon dioxide and methane are the, the two principal ones we have to worry about. Carbon dioxide stays much longer in the atmosphere than methane, so that's why we focus on it. But methane per molecule is somewhat more powerful greenhouse. We have to worry about both of those. And um, if you looked at that pie chart of greenhouse gas emissions, about three quarters comes from energy. It's not all of it, and we have to worry about particularly agriculture is another big part of that pie. But the first place to focus attention is energy. And so we have to either learn how to uh, generate, economically generate energy, not just electricity, we need high temperature industrial heat. Um, that can be done by nuclear power, for example. Um, but also uh, electricity, we need to electrify vehicles and, the, and we desperately need a much better and cheaper storage options. So anything we can do to accelerate the innovation and deployment of those would be important uh, in, our, in our fight against uh, global climate change. Uh, so there is another question, like, uh, according to you, how successful was the 2030 agenda of UN to control climate change? Well, I, you know, so far, what I see is a great deal of talk. Um, some of it is sincere, some of it less so, and not very much change, not nearly fast enough. So these treaties, the Paris Agreement and so forth, they're important steps, more, more psychologically than anything else. It, it just people telling each other that they're worried about this problem is actually a good thing, but it hasn't helped. I mean, for example, there is this huge uh, movement in Germany uh, to go to a high percent of renewables and they're clear, currently more than 40%. And it feels good, but they actually haven't reduced their emissions very much. Um, and that the reason is, is that they make up for the rest of it with coal and or buying electricity from other countries, which comes from a variety of sources. And so they ended up with very expensive electricity without really doing much. So I'm afraid that the problem here really is that we as a species are not programmed to genetically and arguably have never before dealt with a major threat to ourselves that exists on the time scale of many decades. We're very good at dealing with immediate threats, but this is experimental for us. Um, professor, like in the age of globalization, how should a state deal with environmental issue, particularly with third world states? as core state exploits periphery states for profit. 
how should the United Nations play a role uh, in mitigating climate change? Well, um, I think, I, you know, you're asking me a question, uh, which is an excellent question but it's really outside my expertise. I'm a climate scientist, I'm not a policy expert. I don't pretend to be one, but just speaking more as a citizen of the world and of US as it happens than a scientist, I would say that you know the United Nations uh, could help catalyze this whole business about pricing carbon. Um, the way the world works is that you do need economic stimulation toward innovation and toward decarbonizing. And uh, how can you get, uh, you need global cooperation to do this. If one country says, we're gonna, uh, it's not gonna, all it's gonna do is make their own citizens angry because they have to pay more for fuel, but nobody else around the world does. And so they start losing in competitive markets. You really need global action, whether the United Nations is the best way to do that, I don't know, but it is a mechanism, certainly. Uh, thank you, sir. We are running out of time, so let's put two more questions, though we have received around 20 more. Uh, one is on like, uh, like carbon, carboniferous capitalism has defeated the logic of complex interdependence in many substantial ways, tragedy of commons and live Relative gain logic still hold good. Big power are not co cooperating with international institutions and protocol. So how do you see the case of complex interdependence in this backdrop? It's a political question. So if you want, you can touch upon that. Let me raise one more question. Like after the transformation of climate change regime with Paris and uh, what we see is the lack of efficiency of indices that were submitted, what would, be, what would you believe will happen in the future of climate governance? What could be the next step made by the policymakers to get better result and efficiency? Well, I'm gonna give you a subjective answer to both questions in a way. Um, that, you know, countries historically, nations have reacted to two kinds of pressure. One is economic pressure. If they're under economic pressure, Pressure that they will try to uh, for them economically. That's again here in climate change. I've already sort of spoken to that thing that if you can innovate a carbon-free energy source, uh, you can make a lot of money that broad. But the other source of pressure that works is political pressure. And this is just my observation. It works best when it comes from young people. So all of the people of my uh, advanced age and generation, we can have accords and talks and agreements, but they won't mean anything unless there is a sort of a global, in this case, a global uh, movement of young people to simply say they're not gonna tolerate any more in action. I think this is beginning to happen. You know, I was raised in the United States in the era of the Vietnam War, and it's a complex situation, a war, but it ended when young people, and I was young at the time, had had enough and, uh, and made it very, very plain, the older people, that they weren't gonna tolerate this anymore. And this is what has to happen. Uh, if young people are buried in their telephones and their social media and they can't come out and organize uh, and put pressure on their, their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation to do something, I don't think anything will happen. So I think it's going to be a combination of economic opportunity and political pressure from young people. And I see both of them beginning to happen. Um, Professor Imel, thank you very, very much for your wonderful discussion. We learned a lot. I'm sure all our participants and participants immensely benefited and benefited from it. We still have lots of questions, but we have come to the end of the program. We are really grateful for your time and thank you for your kind presence. We are glad that you are optimistic and you have feel hope in uh, in us. So it has it has really encouraged us. We hope to see you in real or maybe in Nepal or in other parts of the world. Um, have a nice day and good night to all our participants.
from South Asia. Thank you.